On the 28th of October 2004, 50-year-old Dave Shaw prepared to dive into the world's third deepest freshwater cave, named Bushman's Hole in Northern Cape, South Africa. Dave was a man eager for adventure and motivated to explore the depths few others had. But the dive was far from easy. Bushman's Hole had claimed two lives from 1993 to 1994, the first being Eben Leyden, who blacked out at 60 metres and drowned. The second, D'Andrea, who drowned on his ascent at 50 metres and could not be recovered. Those who have explored the depths of the Bushman Hole and lived to tell the tale did not do so without their own complications either. On a previous 7.5 hour expedition in 1993, Sheck Exley had touched the bottom at 263 metres. At around 210 metres, Sheck experienced high pressure neurological syndrome as a result of the depth and helium mixed in the breathing gas. With his vision failing, Sheck slowed his descent at 224 metres, only to experience itching all over his body, which would soon turn into a stinging sensation. By the time he was nearing the bottom, his body began to tremor, and only continued in intensity. Sheck is quoted describing his experience, saying, The tremors were quite intense by the time I reached the bottom. Severe enough to make the operation of my inflator difficult. My entire body began trembling, gradually escalating to uncontrollable shaking by the time I landed. Another diver by the name of Nuno Gomez would break this record on a 12 hour operation, reaching 282 meters. However, he too would run into problems after finding himself stuck in the mud at the bottom of the cave for over two minutes. He described his experience as the following. Suddenly and unexpectedly, the bottom came into sight, with only two of my torches still working. The two Sabolite beams lit up the bottom clearly. The other two torch bodies had been squashed by the pressure, and the terminals were not making contact. My view of the bottom in the moment of glory was short and sweet. I saw a lunar-type landscape of grey silt, with the odd small rock sticking out, and there was some slack rope on the flat bottom. There were holes in the grey silt where weights had gone in, as well as a small ledge which I had to get past to reach the deepest spot about 5 metres away horizontally. There was only one way, I had to swim whilst taking up the slack on the rope. Since I was negatively buoyant and had no time to inflate the wings, I landed on all fours. My worst nightmare came true, I silt out at the bottom of a very deep cave with a slight guideline while on all fours and under the influence of nitrogen narcosis and helium tremors. My first priority was to stand up without losing balance or becoming tangled in or losing the line. The quads and two side mounts did not help, I tried to swim up but failed and became dizzy. I relaxed and inflated the wings. It took 30 kilos of lift to ascend 15 meters and get out of the mud and silt. Undeterred by these experiences, Dave Shaw slipped into the cold water and began his descent through the narrow entrance and into the main chamber where the darkness swallowed him. With his high intensity light perched downward, Dave searched for a sign of rock or mud indicating that he'd reached the bottom of the cave. At 270 meters, Dave would spot something, but it wasn't rock or mud. Illuminated by his light in the clear water depths was the figure of a man 50 feet to the left of him. The man lay on his back, with his arms reaching toward the surface of the cave. At that moment, Dave guessed it could only be the man who had lost his life in the cave over 10 years prior. 20-year-old D'Andrea. In what would have surely been a frightening experience, the hands reaching for the surface were now just bone, and Dion's diving mask sat snugly around his now skeletonized head. Dave attempted to wrap his arms around Dion's body and pull him up, but the body refused to move. Kneeling down, Dave tried once more, but he was still unable to unearth the body. It appeared Dion's air tanks and battery pack were buried deeply in the mud. Now panting from exertion, and realising he was over a minute behind his planned time, and would still have close to 9 hours decompression time on the ascent, Dave attached a reel to Dion's tanks to ensure he could be found again, and swam back toward the mouth of the cave. At 121 metres, Dave would meet his friend, Don Shirley, and pass him a diving slate with the words, 270 metres, found a body. 
Though Don admitted he was content to leave Dion's body where it rested, he knew Dave would soon return to the Bushman's Point in search of Dion. Over ten years since his passing, Dion's parents had come to terms with the fact their son's body rested at the bottom of Bushman's Point. His mother, with the knowledge of Eben Laden's death, had begged him not to go, but Dion was content with his decision, and had told his father two weeks before his passing that if he had a choice of how he would die, it would be from diving. But these feelings changed on October 30th, 2004, when Dave Shaw called Theo and Mary Dreyer and said, I'll go fetch your son. It would be a risky task, but if pulled off successfully, the recovery of Dion's body would be the deepest body recovery in the history of diving. In preparation for the rescue, forensic experts were consulted to gauge an idea of the body's composition. Not certain, these experts guessed the body would mostly be bone, leading Shaw to the conclusion he would need a body bag to secure Dion and eliminate any risk of the body falling apart on the ascent. On January 2nd, 2005, Dave arrived back in Johannesburg, six days before the scheduled recovery mission. In that time, he stopped at Kamadi Springs and practiced using his body bag with Don playing the part of the corpse, which at 20 meters only took him a few minutes. Dave and Don prepared a rope and sling system to be set up to haul a diver on a stretcher up to the cliff's hole to a recompression chamber brought in by police. A doctor who specialised in diving physiology was also hired. Nine divers were prepared for the recovery, and Dave, although confident, stressed that they were engaging in an attempted body recovery. On Saturday the 8th of January 2005, the team gathered for their last briefing before the recovery. Dave told them, The most important person on this dive is you. If you have a problem, deal with your problem and forget about me. It's better to have one person dead than two. Don would later ask Dave in private if he wanted him to come down if any problems arose. Dave replied yes, but only come down if I signal. As the team readied themselves, Don's final message was rather grim. He said, if Dave doesn't make it, if I don't make it, we stay there. That's the end of the story. We don't want to be recovered. In the early hours of the morning, the rocky dive site began to crowd with a mix of divers and paramedics. By 6.13am, Dave shook Don's hand and said, I'll see you in 20 minutes, before he descended into the dark water of Bushman's Point. A few minutes after his descent, Dion's parents arrived at the edge of the cave opening, having come intentionally late to avoid adding pressure on Dave as he attempted to bring their son back to them. Eleven minutes into the dive, Dave found himself ahead of schedule, hitting the bottom of the cave a minute and a half early. Traversing the cave line, Dave saw Dion's body in the distance, and soon was kneeling beside it, preparing to free him from the mud. By this time, Dave had been 886 feet deep for over a minute, and Don started his descent to 720 feet to meet Dave on his way back. Approaching 500 feet through the clear water, Don was relieved to see Dave's light was where he expected it to be. But Don's relief soon turned to horror when he noticed Dave was not ascending and there was no air bubbles rising from his direction. At this depth, Don could only surmise Dave was no longer alive, but rather than leave his friend, he dived down, attempting to see if there was anything he could do. At 800 feet, Don's hammerhead controller, responsible for monitoring the oxygen levels in his rebreather and injecting oxygen into his breathing loop, was crushed under the water's pressure. Without this control, Don would be forced to manually monitor and inject his oxygen, something he couldn't do if he continued descending down. While this was happening, two additional divers stationed at the 150 meter point were waiting anxiously for Dave and Don, but neither of the two men ascended. After six minutes, the two divers began heading back and passed an additional two divers waiting around the 80 meter point. Here they would pass on the message through their diving slate, stating, Did not meet D&D at 150 meters for six min. One light below, not sure, D's light is off. One of the additional support divers, by the name of Herbst, was Don's best friend, and he decided to descend further in the hopes of at least finding his best friend Don alive. At 120 meters, he spotted Don, who flashed him a sign that he was okay, before lifting a diving slate which said, Dave not coming back. 
Within 20 minutes, the slate was passed by divers to the surface, and the team, as well as Dion's parents, were made aware of Dave's passing. Dion's parents, now riddled with guilt and saddened by the thought of another man leaving his family behind, made their way back to their farmhouse, where Dave had stayed the night previous. While a sense of relief washed over the remaining team, that at least one of the two divers survived, it was short-lived, as the figures on the slate showed Don had gone so deep he now risked getting decompression sickness. An underwater cameraman by the name of Derek Hughes soon left the site under instruction given to him by Dave Shaw before his dive. Derek had been asked to call Dave's family minister if he didn't make it. By 7pm, Dave's wife Anne and their 21-year-old daughter Lisa received a knock on the door of their residence in Hong Kong. The thought of bad news would have been in the back of Anne's mind, as Dave had told her the rescue operation was taking place a day later, with the intention of calling her on the day she believed he would be diving to tell her he was coming home. Unfortunately, when she opened the door to find the family's minister and two friends, Anne knew something had gone horribly wrong. Back at the dive site, Don fought for his own survival, succumbing to vomiting, vertigo, and a near hypothermic state. After 12 and a half hours of fighting sickness and the grief that came with losing his friend, Don finally surfaced and was rushed into a recompression chamber. With the failure of the rescue mission and the death of their friend, the remaining team spent the next few days clearing out their equipment from the depths of the cave. During this time, Herbst was approached by a police diver, who asked, Did you see them? Herbst replied, See what? The police diver then told him he'd seen Dion and Dave stuck in the cave at only 20 meters. Shortly after, Herbst dived into the cave and located Dave. He was now floating upright, with his arms spread and the back of his head and shoulders crammed against the ceiling of the cave. Dave's light had been looped around the cave line he attached to Dion, and below him, Dion's headless body floated. Herps realized that Dave's light had become tangled in Dion's line, and when the team had pulled on their shot line, it dislodged the bodies. Once Dave's body gases began to expand after death, his body rose to the top, bringing Dion with him on the tangled line. After recovering both bodies, Herbst was able to review the footage captured on Dave's camera. He watched Dave reach Dion's body, 12 minutes and 22 seconds into the dive, and pull out the body bag. Dave attempted to work the legs into the bag like he'd practiced with Don, but after pulling on Dion's leg, a cloud of silt obscured the camera's vision. As the silt settled, Herbst saw Dion's now headless body floating in front of Dave. The movement of the corpse caught Dave off guard, as two things had gone wrong at once. First, the team believed Dion's body would be in a skeletal and immobile state, making it easier to contain into the body bag. However, instead of decomposing, Dion's corpse had been mummified into a soap-like substance that gave it mass and neutral buoyancy. Second, Dion's body had been stuck deep in mud when Dave first encountered it, but for unexplainable reasons, the body was no longer stuck. This made it much harder for Dave to get the body into the bag, as the plan was conceived and practiced with the belief Dion's body would be immobile. Despite this, an audible grunt is heard, and Dave's breath quickens as he tries to get Dion's rolling and turning body into the bag. Attempting to control the body, Dave lets go of his cave light, allowing him to use both hands, but even with two hands, Dave is unable to get the body into the bag. After struggling with the body for two minutes, the cave line is jumbled and snags his cave light. Dave appears to realize that this has happened and stops to try clear it. At this point, he's been at the bottom of the cave for over three and a half minutes and spent two and a half minutes exerting himself. Dave then pulls out his shears and fumbles to open them, as his breathing continues to grow faster. Suddenly, Dave loses his footing, and a cloud of silt covers the camera. Only audible grunts of effort can be heard. Once the silt is settled, Dave's actions look confused and without purpose, as he continues to check the time on his dive computer. After five and a half minutes at the bottom of the cave, he finally attempts to leave. The video shows the bottom moving beneath him before he stops. His cave light has been snagged on the line, attached to Dion's tanks. 
Turning awkwardly, his breath becomes desperate as he tries to yank on the line and move forward. Sadly, Dion's body is still attached and anchoring him down with its weight. Soon after, Dave begins to pass out as carbon dioxide fills his lungs, and a minute later, all movement ceases. While the risk of Dave losing his life was a possibility, it was not one the divers with him believed would occur. When asked about the incident, support diver Mark Andrews replied, If you asked me about the chances before the dive, I'd have said there is a 99% chance of success and a 1% chance he'll have to leave the body, and a 0% chance that Dave wasn't coming back. Though Don Shirley survived, his attempt to reach Dave resulted in a helium bubble forming inside his head. For over a month, Don could not think or walk clearly in a crowded street without his perception or balance being affected. Even now, after recovery, Don still suffers from helium bent that has permanently impaired balance. The only silver lining to the story may just be it wasn't all for nothing in the end. Ten days after Dion and Dave were recovered, Theo and Mary Dreyer were allowed to view their son, and a grateful Mary was able to hug him for the last time. In passing, Dave Shaw left behind his wife and two children, and many heartbroken friends. Deciding to put Dave to rest in the place he'd come to love, Anne Shaw requested his ashes be spread in South Africa. And on an evening in May, Don and Andre Shirley climbed to the summit of a mountain close by to their home, and returned his ashes to the earth.